Well, this is a celebration of the life and work of Patrick Chabal, and I'm very pleased to uh, chair this session. Just a very small tribute at the very beginning, and I will do it in a reversed way. First, Pat Patrick Chabal uh, is a family man, uh, because he left an extraordinary family. Um, his wife, Dr. Farzana Sheikh, is a, a widely recognized and known scholar, and uh, her latest book, Making Sense of Pakistan, had a major impact. Uh, and uh, his um, son, Emil Shabal, also uh, had a brilliant career as a student, and now he is at Edinburgh, and uh, he, is, uh, or he has already two contracts for books, and so he is beginning uh, um, also his career. Then Patrick as a colleague. Uh, I think we, have, we had already this morning and this early afternoon some ideas about uh, his impact. Uh, the students, I think that was the most impressive uh, uh, testimony and that's the most important thing in academic life. Uh, I must say that uh, I had a very good relation with him. We shared the the, at a certain point, the headship of the Department of Portuguese and Brazilian Studies. It was a difficult moment, uh, and I can only say the best of Patrick as a colleague. He was loyal, uh, he was uh, extremely competent, he had a very good vision of things. We shared uh, uh, generally the same vision of the, of the future uh, and of the problems, and um, uh, he was efficient and he was, he had a vision, that, that was the most important thing. Uh, but I always like to turn things around and to look at the beginning of the career, and that's something that we didn't do here. And uh, uh, the beginning is also important, and Patrick managed to establish very good relations with people and with uh, academics uh, all his life, namely John Dunn, uh, particularly Peter Burke, and last time I was uh, in their house, it was with Peter Burke. Uh, and um, I bet Peter would have loved to be here also. Uh, and uh, Elder, Professor Elder Masid, who had the highest opinion of Patrick Chabal, many times he told me, and uh, who developed the Department of Portuguese Studies and created several jobs uh, and from the chairs of today's session, three were created by him. So, um, I mean the jobs. Uh, so, uh, uh, and Patrick had a, a very good dynamic with this academic, so to look at the beginning, it's also extremely important. Um, and finally, the, uh, uh, and I don't want to step on, on, my, on my colleagues here, finally, the research. For me, there are three or four major points in, in uh, Patrick's career. Uh, first, he did one of the first biographies of nationalist African leaders, Amilcar Cabral. And that was not easy. To, it's a, a specific genre, the biography. And he did it very well. Second, he managed to engage with post-colonial African literature with uh, political science, science and historical background. And he, he contributed decisively to create the field of literary studies in that area. Uh, and that, I don't, I don't know of many other scholars who could do that, or who did that. Um, and then he played also decisive, or he contributed decisively with uh, Jean Pascal Dalos uh, uh, to the Machiavellian moment in Africa. Because what they did was exactly what Machiavelli did in the 16th century in Europe. It was to connect with empirical reality and get over ideal visions of what should be or uh, what might be in the future African politics, they dealt with precise reality, where it came from, 
uh, and what was the logic of that reality. So that was a major breakthrough. It was already discussed here. Um, and there is another issue I was talking about, about the, the biography, but there is another issue which I think it's crucial. Patrick Chabal persevered writing essays. And rest essays are, from my point of view, crucial. They change knowledge. It's not the pedestrian articles with lots of footnotes of archival research. They can be extremely revealing, but it's with these essays that knowledge is addressed and knowledge, knowledge is changed. So Patrick persevered with this genre of essay, which is completely out of fashion for reason, institutional reasons, we all know about. And uh, uh, I think it's a big lesson uh, to, to persevere with, uh, with essays. And I stop here. So I, I will introduce my, my distinguished colleagues. Um, we have uh, Michael uh, Dwyer from the Hearst Publishers. Uh, uh, here at my right, uh, um, who has been playing an important role as a publisher, by the way, and who will uh, talk about his experience with, with Patrick. Thank you. Well, as a publisher at the forefront of technology, um, I wasn't aware I had to speak this afternoon, so I've not, I hadn't prepared anything. Um, there's nothing printed out, and I have a laptop which has about 10 minutes of power left on it, so you have to bear with me. Um, I did take some notes earlier on uh, about my working relationship with Patrick, which um, went over several, well, 15, 16 years. And uh, um, Patrick uh, wrote, so I'm just waiting for this technology to start yet. Patrick wrote to me um, when uh, my colleague Christopher Hurst died a few years ago. And his, um, his note to me encapsulated everything about Patrick that I, I came to, to value as um, a working colleague. It was extremely gracefully written, it was extremely humane, and it was extremely intellectually fierce and honest. And every encounter of mine with Patrick was tinged by those aspects of his um, personality and his, his intellect, which um, I found daunting to engage with most of the time and felt also that my encounters with Patrick were very much, although I never studied with him, of course, rather a bit like you know, a tutorial in that I felt I was learning from him um, as part of our working relationship. And it's nice to say that that occurs with many authors, but it's, it's, far, it's far rarer than you, you might imagine. Anyway, so the technology has now kicked in. So um, Patrick wrote to me as follows, I'm truly sorry to hear this news about Christopher Hurst's death, though I long feared the worst. You will know that my association with him goes back a very long time, and that I always admire his forthrightness and his commitment to independent publishing. He really is the reason I, why I remained loyal to Hurst. I also admire his willingness to get his hands dirty in the reading and editing of the manuscripts. Although he appeared to many, quote, merely, quote, merely, end quote, eccentric, I always found that his was a very human way of dealing with authors and with others. I chose these few sentences of Patrick's precisely because they were typical of his great acuity and kindness, as I said earlier, but also because they indicate how gracefully he wrote both in a professional and a private capacity. As this quote also suggests, while his relationship with Christopher Hurst and me I think more with the former than with the latter, may occasionally have strayed into the adversarial. Rather than to confront, um, to force issues to a head, Patrick always regarded them, and I could see it in action in his interaction with Christo Christopher and later with me, as a challenge, an objective to be captured, to be dealt with, rather than some sort of impasse that uh, would, would lead nowhere. Um, also, we had famously cramped offices in King Street in the Africa Centre, which many of you visited. Um, and I, I thought on many occasions too, we were the beneficiaries of um, Patrick's ideas of the instrumental, instrumentalization of disorder. Uh, both in terms of ways he suggested that we could be doing things better and uh, how to broaden our horizons as, our horizon as publishers on Africa. 
And I think Christopher took a little while to see the utility of these interventions, but I always found them extremely engaging, and he did, he did really inspire me, and he also won Christopher round. Um, as I said, I learned a great deal from working with Patrick, especially in terms of how to think differently about Africa, if that doesn't sound too, um, too, too, too big an idea to convey, and how to approach it intellectually and commercially too. He had an opinion about many aspects of publishing, which many of you may not know, and he enjoyed quizzing, quizzing me on its peculiarities, its innovations, its trade secrets, and its pitfalls. And this is, you know, before digitization, when it was just uh, print and ink. Very inquisitive mind, and every, every meeting with him, as I said, I was learning, and I felt he just wanted to really get to grips with this then and probably still archaic process. process. Um, he also put up, put up with my and Christopher's instinctive British attachment to empiricism, um, tempered by fondness for an attachment to local cultural knowledge on the part of our authors. It's just, just something that we like to publish. He figured out uh, how to convince me and, and Christopher too of the virtues of culture troubles and seeded, succeeded in uh, leading us graciously into the choppy waters of theory and to big ideas that transcend time and location, which we'd not been notable for publishing in the past. Um, in my view, successful publishing is all about nurturing successful relationships, like many aspects of business. And the authors with whom one edits two, three, four, or five, or even more books are the ones one cherishes particularly. I can think, you know, in this context of Gerald Prunier, uh, Stephen Ellis, Malin Newitt, and of course, Patrick, uh, with whom I worked with on six books. I won't, because you're all aficionados of his work, list them, that would be, um, that's unnecessary today, but you, you all know the books in question. Um, I, I remember particularly how he, he convinced me to republish the Amilcar Cabral biography and his, his, his cool fury that Cambridge University Press had let it go out of print. Um, and it was that, and then uh, leading on to broader discussions that I think I think prompted me to ask him to write the post-colonial history of the Lucifer Africa. I think that was my idea, but maybe one of the contributors here will put me right if that's not the case, after having published the Lucifer literature uh, volume. Um, the LSE obituary written by someone there for Patrick, I noted the other day, said, Patrick Chabal did not become a scholar in order to make friends, um, which struck me as both true and um, quite erroneous, because uh, he certainly succeeded in making uh, a great friend of, my, of mine, and through him I also had the privilege of meeting Fazana and of publishing her excellent book, Making Sense of Pakistan, which appeared in, in 2009. I'll wrap up now. I just want to say, in terms of personal relationships, how sometimes you don't learn enough about people when you have a business relationship with them. Uh, it was only in the last year of his life that I realised uh, that Patrick and I shared a great passion for football, especially the football of Africa, and we both play football. So I'd known him all these years. And with, I remember we spent an evening in Paris chatting very, very animatedly about football. He couldn't believe that I liked football and I liked playing football, and I couldn't believe the reverse. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this vivid contribution. Uh, and we have with us also Professor Graham Furness from the School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, he published on uh, house of poetry and on, uh, extensively on uh, orality and oral literature in Africa. So this is the literary side, also dimension which comes in uh, very, very, very joyfully. And so, um, uh, well, we'll hear about his exp experience with Patrick. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about oral literary studies, and I don't have any anecdotes about football. I, w I wish I did. But I just wanted to tell you a little bit about, uh, well, when I first met uh, Patrick, um, it was at a moment in the late 80s when Richard Rathbone was the a chairman of the Centre of African Studies, which is, was at University of London Centre at that time. 
still is formerly. And I was, in a sense, Richard's deputy, as since that I was the convener of the MA in Area Studies Africa, um, which was operating at that time. And it was a wonderful master's degree. And the reason it was so wonderful was not only because um, it allowed a variety uh, of types of course, but it drew upon people at SOAS, yes, but it had courses from Patrick Chabal on Lucifer Africa, Lucifer literature, politics and history of Lucifer Africa. But it also had James Mayle teaching international relations from the LSE. It had Tony O'Connor and other people teaching geography from UCL. It had anthropologists, Murray Last, Phil Burnham and others teaching for, at UCL. I think Dave Anderson was at um, Birkbeck at that time, offering a history course from Birkbeck. It was a wonderful federal University of London master's degree, an intercollegiate degree of a stupendous range and depth. And it was through that that I got to know Patrick because uh, he was very keen to see that master's degree grow and develop. But it was at precisely that time that the bean counters, uh, the people who count the profit and loss on teaching were beginning to say, no, no, and these were in the finance departments very often of the colleges of the university, where they would say, well, you know, we're losing money on this one. We're taking in more from here, but we're not, and there was a certain amount of transfer of fees went on, but these administrations were constantly looking to throw up shutters, pull up the drawbridge, put barriers in the way of this unique system of collaboration that we had. And that has shrunk more and more. Things have changed. There are new centers of African studies in other places. There are different types of degrees. Everything has changed. But my recollection was that Patrick understood and wanted there to be that kind of range of study, that interdisciplinary work, that availability for the students of a, 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 a range of, of work in social sciences and humanities. And, and as the years went on, um, he regretted it as much, what happened as much as, as, as I did. It was after uh, Richard finished as chair of Cent the Centre of African Studies that uh, I had the privilege of succeeding him. And the second thing I want to relate to you relates is, is to do with, with that period. So this is the, 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 from about 1990 through to about 1994. And at that stage, um, at SOAS, we had a bilateral link with the Centre d'Etudes d'Afrique Noire, Jean uh, Pascal will, will remember, in Bordeaux. And Richard and uh, Donald Cruz O'Brien had been very instrumental in developing and growing that with Christian Coulon and, uh, and others um, in Bordeaux. Well, I stepped into Richard's shoes and that involved visiting Bordeaux. So I went on a couple of occasions, I, in my second year went to Bordeaux and at that particular point we were in a restaurant down by the port, delicious, beautiful wine, <laughs> and, and there was Alain Ricard and there was Christian Coulon and there was uh, Rob Bautenhaus from Leiden there were a couple of people from Barcelona because, of course, Bordeaux had its own bilateral links with a number of different places. And over that restaurant meal, and when we'd had a good couple of bottles of wine, somebody said, you know, here we are gathered together. Instead of having all these bilateral links, why don't we form a, a group, you know, a network? Wouldn't that be a good idea? So everybody said, yeah, it's a wonderful idea, and we all went off. Well, a year later, there was a formal proposal to create a network of cent European centers of African studies. Richard Farden, who was, a little, who was here a little earlier, came with me on that occasion. And sure enough, in Bordeaux, we created what then became Aegis. Um, I, some of you will have heard of that organization. It is still the only pan-European uh, network of centers of African studies still functioning, still working. So it was in about 91, I think, that that meeting was held, 92, in, in Bordeaux. Well, one of the things that happened 
uh, that very first stage was um, a resolution was passed that each sovereign uh, European nation state could have only one center of African studies uh, as member. We didn't propose this from London, and I don't think uh, I don't think Christian Coulomb proposed this, but I can, it may have come from the Italians, or it might have been the, the Spaniards. I can't remember. Barcelona and, and Madrid were not talking to each other uh, at that stage. Well, that really set the cat amongst the pigeons, and so a year later, a meeting was called in Lisbon. And it, of course, naturally, one of these administrative meetings happens on the back of a conference. So Richard Farden and I are due to go representing London uh, in the management group of Aegis. And it just so happens that, Pasca, uh, that uh, Pasca, um, Patrick is going to the conference. And he, said, he says to us, I see you're going to be there. And we said, well, well, let's travel together. OK, fine. And we all bought tickets, um, cheap tickets from, uh, I think it was from uh, Gatwick. We arrive at Gatwick and we meet up and um, we're about to go through and um, Patrick goes, oh no, oh Lord, I haven't got my passport. It's on the kitchen table back in Cambridge or wherever it was. And we thought, oh no, what are we going to do? So he said, well, you know, we're in this new world of Schengen and borderless Europe. I mean, I've got my driving license and I've got some other documentation. Maybe we, maybe, why don't we try and get through? <laughs> so sure enough, we, we get through. He just explains that he's left his passport behind and here's his identity. He's a professor at King's. Uh, so we go through, no problem. We arrive in Lisbon. Uh, he comes in, no problem whatsoever. And Patrick became involved in the discussions around this issue of only one center from each nation state. And he was very good at negotiating, particularly because war had been declared between one group in Lisbon and another group in Lisbon, and Patrick was able to sort all this out. Of course, we abandoned that rule, I think, a year later. And, and it was a ridiculous rule in the first place. Nevertheless, Patrick showed that he had great negotiating skills as well as, of course, his complete fluency in French, his complete fluency in Portuguese, complete fluency in English, complete fluency in a, a range of other languages and cultures. So Patrick it, it becomes, in fact, the very first president of Aegis. And I think he was president of Aegis for must have been 10 years as the organization grew. But the, the story I'm working my way to is what happened as we finished. Because the three of us booked on the same flight again, Richard Barden, myself, and Patrick, and we go to the airport, and we book in, and we're walking through, and the three of us are side by side talking about something. We show, I, I show my passport, he, he explains in Portuguese that he's just got this document, etc. He walks through, and as we're walking along the corridor, he's suddenly grabbed from behind and whisked off into a side room. And Richard and I stand there and go, what was that? What was happened? Where is he? What's happened? And we stand, we stand, we waited five minutes, ten minutes went by. We tried to get in, we were blocked. And then we, we, were, we were told, uh, no, no, he's being uh, questioned. Go through, go through. You get on the plane, go through. And Richard and I said, well, no, no, we're not, we're not going through. You know, he's, he's our colleague. We've just been at a conference together. Um, we'll wait for him here. We stood there in the corridor and we waited. We could hear Patrick inside talking in Portuguese and we could hear his discussion going on. Eventually, Patrick comes out and he says, they're detaining me. <laughs> and we said, what? He said, they're detaining me. They say, you know, I don't have a passport. I don't have a visa to enter Britain. They're detaining me. And now, we had th when we'd originally faced this issue of Patrick no passport, we had thought that he might have some difficulty <coughs> getting back into the UK if he didn't have his British passport with him. We'd never thought that anyone would prevent him leaving Portugal. <laughs> you know. we, uh, the time was passing. It was getting closer to the departure of the plane. There was backwards and forwards. We went in. We absolutely insisted we were not leaving the country without him. He was trying to negotiate some kind of agreement. 
And eventually, just before the, the gates were due to close, he let, they let him go and he came and we ran through and we just got onto the plane and we got back. And I remember he said, he said, look, he said, I understood in the end what their problem was. They had no problem about me leaving Portugal. Their problem was they did not want the British immigration officials in Gatwick to phone them up and say, you lazy, <laughs> you've let another illegal immigrant <laughs> into Europe. <laughs> and Richard and I were astonished. Now I have to say something else. I, when I had hair, it was quite blonde. My eyes aren't exactly blue, but they're sort of bluish. Richard Farden, who's not here now, but he was sitting over there, he similarly had sort of blondish hair and blue eyes. And Patrick said, <laughs> this is ironic, he said, here we are trying to build a, a network of collaboration Europe-wide, while Fortress Europe, we've just seen Fortress Europe being constructed. And he said, I wonder whether it would have happened if I'd had, like you, blue eyes and blonde hair. I wouldn't have been thought a Moroccan, probably, as they had thought. Thank you. Well, thank you, Graham, for, uh, for all your vivid uh, uh, me memoirs and also for this uh, uh, last uh, comment on stereotyping, which I like very much. <laughs> uh, now we have Professor Mali Newitt, Emeritus Charles Boxer Professor, my brilliant predecessor here at King's, who wrote extensively on the history of the uh, Lusophone Africa uh, and uh, also post-colonial uh, independent countries. I don't like post-colonial as, as a word in these cases, or decolonization I think is even worse uh, because it undermines uh, the, the, the effort uh, for the struggle for liberation. Uh, but uh, so he, he has also very good uh, 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 memoirs uh, concerning Patrick Chabot, please. Thank you very much, but I want to start with a memory concerning my colleague on the right uh, who has not yet been introduced to Richard Rathbone. Richard used to chair a research seminar at SOAS um, to which uh, Africanists were invited. And soon after I came to King's in 1998, I was invited to um, give a paper at his seminar. And I was introduced in this way, and it's the most marvelous introduction I think anyone has ever been given. He said, it's the custom of this seminar to invite uh, young Africanists who are just beginning to build their careers, and then again to invite them in the twilight of their <laughs> academic <laughs> And he then said, so I welcome Professor Newitt for the second time. <laughs> <laughs> but to go back to Patrick, I, I knew Patrick's writings before I met him, and <clears throat> after I was appointed to the chair at King's, um, I still had a year or 18 months to complete at University of Exeter, where I was holding an official position. Uh, and in that 18 months, I had contacts, uh, built contacts with Patrick, one of which was to invite him <laughs> to travel to Tashkent in Uzbekistan, where <laughs> where um, the University of Exeter, where I then was, had, had dealings. And uh, Patrick was intrigued by this. I think he must already have finished um, the, the text of um, his great work with uh, Jean Pascal uh, on patrimonialism. But the temptation of uh, seeing uh, Central Asian patrimonialism at, at full stretch the, the regime of uh, Islam Karimov in Uzbekistan was obviously irresistible. So he came along um, with a party that I was leading to Tashkent, but he asked me, what exactly am I doing on, on this um, expedition? 
And I said to him, well, all you have to do is sit and listen and ask difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think I'd realised at that time quite how appropriate that was, <laughs> because that is exactly, that's exactly uh, what Patrick was so good at doing. After, uh, very sadly, after his death, um, I was approached by, uh, uh, by Portuguese, um, editor of a Portuguese online journal, um, to see if I would do an interview with him uh, about Patrick. And one of the questions in the interview was, um, Patrick Chabal has been described as the unelected dean of African studies in Europe. What did I think about that? And I said that I thought it was most inappropriate that although, of course, he was one of the most distinguished Africanists whose works were extremely influential and widely read, Patrick was not a, an establishment figure. He was not a figure of authority, which was suggested by the word dean. He was always a rebel. And you, if you return to any of his writings, he is always challenging existing orthodoxies. And uh, I think this is a um, strain that runs through not only his writing, but um, clearly uh, derived from his own uh, personality as well. Um, the refusal to accept the orthodoxies of his subject, um, which were um, uh, so widely uh, peddled in uh, Africanist circles. And listening to Jean Pascal uh, today and hearing about the hostile reception that Africa works um, received in some quarters, I think you particularly mentioned Uppsala, <laughs> Uppsala. Um, I find this quite extraordinary because rereading the book, as I've done a number of times, um, one of its prevailing themes is to give Africans agency in their own affairs and in their own history. And I would have thought that uh, anybody uh, who had a, a, any sympathies at all for uh, Africa, for the plight of Africans, would have welcomed the idea that Africans actually had agency, that they were not uh, just um, the passive victims um, uh, the playthings of, of international forces and so on. And it was this um, insistence on African agency which, um, for me, colours um, this, uh, this writing. And just in case there is anybody here who's never read Africa Works, I was going to ask for a show of hands, but I won't do that. Um, if you go back to it now, and read it for the first time, but even if you read it for the second or third time, it is an amazing book. The clarity and the simplicity with which the central themes of the book are presented are breathtaking. I don't know any book quite like it. And um, at the risk of sounding absurd, I would make a kind of parallel with the impact that um, Darwin's Origin of Species by Natural Selection, made in the field of biology. Suddenly, a very diverse, very complex field with masses of diverse information, all jostling uh, to be interpreted and understood, is suddenly assembled by an overarching theory and um, which begins to make sense of this diversity. And it's that experience that I have found in reading uh, Africa works. Um, suddenly all the, the vast complexity <laughs> of Africa uh, suddenly begins to be um, uh, take shape in, in a way which is uh, really quite amazing. I think it's a really great book. <laughs> but I wanted also to um, talk a little bit about the book which uh, until um, Francisco mentioned it now I think has not really been mentioned today which is the biography of Amilcar Cabral. Um, possibly in, in the wider academic world, Patrick, it's possible that Patrick is better known for that biography even than for Africa works. Um, it's very widely um, read. Um, it's very widely appreciated. It's, it's a, a standard um, a text uh, for uh, uh, anyone studying um, 
<coughs> the modern history of Lusophone Africa, particularly Guinea. Uh, and of course, it's been re, uh, republished in a, in a new edition. Um, now, the, uh, if you read this book, you, of course, um, you, you realize that Patrick had a great admiration for Cabral, that he um, believed that Cabral was um, a hugely important figure. He was a great organizer, um, a, a great guerrilla leader, and um, a man of um, huge importance in the um, modern history of Lucifer Africa. But this biography is more than um, it seems at first sight. When Patrick was researching and writing it, Amukar Cabral had a kind of status as um, <coughs> a secular saint, particularly in the um, uh, world of left-wing writing and left-wing politics, the red feet, as Nuno described them. Um, Cabral could do very little wrong. He was uh, held up as a great thinker, a great Marxist uh, um, uh, thinker, um, uh, an extraordinarily perceptive, um, far-sighted um, politician, um, and so on. And Patrick doesn't exactly set out to deflate this image of Cabral, but he sets out to make it more real. And I would just draw attention maybe to three aspects of this biography. In the first place, I think there's a whole chapter devoted to um, Cabral as a writer and a thinker. And Patrick makes it quite clear that um, Amilcar Cabral, um, yes, he, he, he spoke uh, uh, um, and um, uh, wrote uh, about um, political affairs and so on, but that he was essentially a derivative um, thinker. He, he, was, um, he cannibalized the writings of other people um, and use them to his, uh, uh, make his uh, points at international gatherings. But he is not an original Marxist thinker. Indeed, Patrick challenges whether he's really a Marxist thinker at all. He is a nationalist, a radical nationalist, but doesn't really fit into any of the uh, paradigms of, of Marxism which were uh, common at the time. The second point is that um, Patrick doesn't shy away from emphasizing the ruthless, ruthless politician uh, that Cabral was. Um, whereas um, pre previous writers had often made him look a, a little bit too good to be true, um, Patrick's biography uh, gives uh, ample um, attention to the um, infighting that took place in PAIGC in its early days. Um, uh, which led, of course, to him uh, overcoming and crushing uh, any opposition to his leadership. And the third point, I think, is that um, one of the strange aspects of Cabral's life was his insistence that um, Guinea and, and Cabo Verde should form a single union and a single independent country. This is really quite extraordinary, and it's very difficult today not to see this as simply a, a barely disguised attempt to replace the colonialism of Portugal by the colonialism of uh, Cabo Verde in, in Guinea. And as we all know, the um, uh, experiment failed um, in 1980, and the two countries split and went their own way. But I, don't, I think Patrick was probably the first person to um, comment on the uh, unreality of this dream of uniting two such dif different and disparate um, countries um, and with, with such different cultures. Um, so one can turn to this biography. It's still by far the best um, account of the life of Amilcar Cabral and realize that Patrick was making um, the story of this man's life more real um, and uh, replacing the, the plaster saint image which the left had uh, created um, in, in the uh, uh, late 1970s. So, <coughs> for me, um, Patrick is the person I still turn to um, when I feel I need to understand what's happening in Africa. And he's certainly still the person I turn to when I need 
to reflect on what happened in the, in the war in, in Guinea. Um, and that is um, a good antidote to the um, recent biographies of Spinola and so on, which have um, created or have attempted to create a kind of new Portuguese narrative of uh, events in Guinea. Um, so it's been um, a great experience to have worked uh, with Patrick. Um, he and I collaborated in two or three books and I was very flattered to have been asked. He, he of course, was always the initiator to have been asked to do so. And um, it was with great sadness that I heard about his death and um, I was able to step in and take over his classes in January of this year. Well, thank you so much for this excellent uh, reflection. Um, and now we have uh, Professor Richard Rathbone from the School of uh, Afri um, Oriental and African Studies. Uh, and he's a specialist of Ghana. He, he, he published extensively on, the, on, on Ghana. And also um, he co-authored a major book on African history. So, you have the floor. I'd like to follow up Malin's comment about sadness. When Toby, I think it was, who told me that Patrick had died, it was a very sad moment for me. And I reflected on the fact that getting older, or getting old, I think, uh, it's none of this comparative stuff anymore, being old uh, is accompanied with a lot of sadness. And in a very short time, uh, some pillars, some real pillars of uh, our fields uh, have been lost to us. Donald Cruz Brown last year, Roland Oliver uh, earlier this year, and now Patrick. I knew all three and other people in the constellation very well. I got to thinking about how these great, great trees in the forest uh, are falling. And, and it's an important thing to recognize that they have fallen. I suppose I'm influenced by the way that uh, Akan people in Ghana talk about the death of kings. Uh, when they say uh, a king has died, they say the tree, the great tree has fallen being a very hot country, trees afford shade, and therefore if the tree falls, you're exposed to the sunshine and you'll frizzle up. But we have lost in Patrick a very, very major figure in African studies, and I've learned today a very great figure in Luciferne studies, and it's not my, my, my field. Um, I knew Patrick very well, um, not as well as I would have liked. Uh, I had a lot of very, very amusing times with Patrick. Um, and uh, a lot of contentious times, as, as Michael pointed out, could fight his corner very well. Um, but one of the things that intrigued me about him was his own biography. And I don't mean early days and, and all of that, but the way in which he figures in a way, in the way that he looked at Africa. And I don't think we look often enough at how um, historians, but I think all sorts of other scholars, uh, are children of their time. We're not just uh, who we are because of what we are, we're also who we are because of the when in our lives. And I was very struck by the contrast between uh, his comparative youth, don't with me, uh, and my, my own career. They're rather similar in some ways. The, the times that uh, specialists on Africa, these early specialists, these people who became the big trees in the forest, uh, emerged. Uh, were very unusually exciting. I don't think they've ever been uh, emulated since. The end of colonial rule, liberation struggles, uh, the aftermath in this country of Suez and so on, were really ter terrifically exciting times. And the uh, inherent optimism, I think, of those days is very evident in, in the literature of those times. It stayed, however, with us, with us all. The point that I would make is that the timing of these things is different because of Patrick's interest in Lucifer in Africa. These things are delayed by 10, uh, nearly 20 years. And consequently, his delight, his enthusiasm, as clear in the, the Cabral biography, uh, followed by, I think, his bewilderment with the aftermath, uh, follows that, I think, of the experience of many Africans who worked on other parts of Africa. I think I'd contrast the this generation uh, of which pa Patrick was certainly a member uh, with some of the younger scholars of today, and no, uh, no, no way in, in denigration, to say that there's, there's something peculiar about 
older people in this field, and I think we would include uh, Patrick. It's a, a generation that was steeped in field work in a way that unfortunately doesn't seem to be affordable any longer, uh, thanks to the mean times we live in. But also in something that I think is very hard to recapture, and that's the intimacy we had with the elites, political elites, but also cultural elites of the places we lived in. A kind of intimacy shown to young scholars, which I think would not be repeated today. You would never get past the, the bodyguards, you'd never get past uh, the test of whether you were important or not. But certainly in the 1960s and the 1970s, it was still possible to know politicians quite well, to know senior civil servants quite well, to know movers and shakers quite well, and to become very affectionate about them, and in some cases to become very uh, antipathetic to them, uh, to the point of loathing them. But these were intimate relationships, which I think are denied today. I think that as a consequence, when, when things fell apart, and I think it's fair to say that they did fairly comprehensively, in terms of the dream that we all had about Africa, the, the disappointment, uh, in some cases the disillusion, the despair, uh, was a very personal, very personal matter. And I think you can find that in Patrick's work. I think that there is a trajectory in his work. And I think that if you uh, biographized uh, the work of any scholar, uh, in, in that kind of way. You'd find revelations about who they were, when they were, and consequently, to some extent, why they were. I think Patrick's bewilderment shows up uh, in terms of the way he tries to sort out the bewilderment in uh, very clear ways. I always enjoyed enormously the way that he kept right into touch the older habit of the generation, the, the Rosbergs and the Colemans and so on, to use paradigms drawn from uh, largely American political science. Lots and lots of books on African politics had footnotes to people like Vio Key and uh, Converse Kick, Miller and Stokes, uh, and of course Duverger, uh, the, you know, the, the way that we studied political parties depended on Maurice Duverger and so on. I, lo I love the way he kept all of that into touch. You don't rely on that any more than you rely on Marxian, uh, Marxian treaties. But you go instead to try and find out uh, something about African politics in its own terms, in the terms of, of, of Africans themselves. I think his own career also reflects, uh, and his intellectual career reflects, something of the tension that built up in the 1970s and 1980s. And I think it's an unresolved tension in uh, African political studies, but also African historical studies. The tension between, on the one hand, specialism, and on the other hand, the, ten uh, the tension with generalization. You're accused, and I'm sure this is no stranger to, to, to you, accused of not being ethnographically sound enough when you talk about the political history here or the political history there. Do you speak the language? No. Well, how possibly have you been? But the moment you make that kind of investment in deep digging, uh, you, of course, lose the chance, because you don't have the time to do it, or the energy, for goodness sake, to read widely around. And you lose, I think, the will to generalize simply out of just sheer terror. You know, you know a lot about X, but how can you talk about the entire alphabet? You can't. And consequently, there is a tension, I think, in his work between the things that he knows a great deal about and the things that he knows less about. And there's a, a, a consciousness about it, which I think led to a degree of confidence, and I think it's justified confidence very often, in making big generalizations in a way that I certainly would never have had the courage to do. Uh, much, much more self-doubting than, than Patrick, or much more self-doubting than I think I thought Patrick was. Uh, and I admire that very greatly in him. Patrick, I think, and his collaborators, their insights rewrote, as Mellon has just said, some of the common generalizations um, about politics. And I think that's fed in, to a certain extent, into uh, the way that politics globally uh, studied and they took the analysis away from simplistic and condescending uh, an analysis, or to smugly being uh, content with, I, I think, rather cheapskate generalizations, as simple, simple, unexplained notions of things like ethnicity and crude uh, misreadings of, of Marxism. African politics, as he insisted right the way through, and Malin's already mentioned this, had to be understood in, in, its, own, in its own terms. And describing and analyzing what it, it might look like became his, his life's work, thank goodness. Mm -hmm.
I admired him very much because, he, again, for reasons that have been said already today, that he was, uh, in his own terms, a, a, an early and courageous realist who defied political correctness. I don't think going on that world tour was something that was done without a great deal of courage. I would certainly would have had the bottle to do that. If we say in English, I'd have been very frightened to, to, to do that, particularly, I think, in terms of a trip around America, which I found a coward before <laughs> doing. Um, I, I think that, uh, in, in many respects, he, he uh, exhibited th throughout his career a, a great deal of, 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 of willful uh, neglect, as it were, of carping. He, he went through things uh, in, in, a, in a very resolute fashion, which I, I think, uh, in fairness, sometimes took prisoners, sometimes didn't. Uh, there's much that one can criticise uh, about, about his corpus, uh, bits of his corpus, anyhow, but there's much to applaud about it. But in, in sort of closing, and I will close because it's getting late, I'd like to emphasise what a very nice man Patrick was. Academics are a pretty horrid lot, by and large. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, be, being rather ancient, I've known rather a lot of them, and there are very few that I would clasp willingly, willingly to my bosom uh, and, and, and have fun with. Uh, Patrick was one of those people I would clasp in my bosom and I would have fun with. There are all sorts of little, little insights into Patrick and, and sort of crazinesses about him, which I really esteem. The discovery um, halfway through a stay there that he had actually rewired the house in Hemingford Abbots gave me both fear and confidence <laughs> at the same time. Um, but, but you know, not many people know that he was actually an extraordinarily good electrician. Um, <laughs> above all things, something that I've come to esteem greatly in, in, in as it were, the dying moments of my game was that he was a great humanist scholar. He, as somebody said earlier today, he really cared about people, he really cared about Africa, he really cared about suffering, and he got pleasure out of smiling, to adopt a, 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 a bit of, of one of his, his, his books. I think that he's very often accused, accused of being uncaring, of being over-pragmatic, of being over Machiavellian, to pick up a, a, an earlier point. But I think that, that to a certain extent, mis misreads him very much. I think he really much did want, did care, and I think he very much did want to solve what are, for all of us, I think, in this room, the intractable problems of understanding a massive continent into which you know, Europe packs ten times with a huge population as culturally varied as you know, Turkey and Oslo uh, and so on. He did want to genuinely crack the code. And he made a very much better job of it than almost anybody else I can think of, think of although I disagree with great chunks of it. He was a lovely man, and the moment I got to his email, uh, I began to miss him, and I still do. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. We have plenty of time uh, for questions, for uh, uh, deeper reflections, uh, and to discuss a little bit more. <laughs>
I think you put your finger on something quite interesting, and that, that is a, um, a recognition that early students of Africa, people who began their careers in the 1950s and the 1960s, were not around ensemble. You didn't become interested in Africa if you were a high Tory, uh, or if you were right wing. It wasn't what you did. Uh, being interested in Africa already was being, in a sense, a card-carrying left liberal. You cared about recruitment, you cared about liberation struggles, you regarded the end of colonialism as a good thing. Uh, you regarded this as a part of the progressive aftermath of the Second World War, and the way that things were going to get better and better and better. And this was a very, very profound symptom of it. The enthusiasm of Africa was quite contagious for those of us who got involved. And consequently, gainsaying aspirations that people really cared about was thought to be, and quite rightly thought to be, I think, just purely negative. So it's not a random sample. Whether it, whether it was a question of define uh, the, the population as a whole is another issue. But I think that there are a number of people here, like Shula Marx, who might confirm or deny this, but convincing people that there was an African history in the 1960s was a really uphill task. I mean, the comment that, I think I still get it from UKIP voters, but I mean, it's a rarer thing than it used to be. Uh, what do you do? I do African history. Is there any? That was a very common response. So there was a crusading element to this and a sympathetic element that had to do with a support of what was felt to be, by, by nearly all of us involved, the legitimate struggle for freedom. Uh, so yes, I think that that entire first generation, and Patrick's part of that, because as I say, I think Lucifer comes in a bit later, uh, are Basil Davidson Davidsonistas in one way or another, uh, in a quite marked way. I don't think the doubts uh, begin to erode that those sorts of common, common feelings until much later. But I think it's a, an interesting point. Um, I, somebody earlier in the day, and I, I forget who, um, discussed this issue and pointing out that the, the left in, in Europe had um, focused on one uh, country after another as being the, the sort of flag bearer of um, the hopes of um, left, left wing utopianism. Um, and they mentioned Viet China and then Vietnam and then Cuba and so on. And certainly around about 19, the 1970s, um, a lot of left-wing utopianism was focused on what was going on in the Portuguese colonies. And uh, to the extent that um, a lot of people were prepared to go out to Angola and Mozambique as cooperantes, um, to, to actually uh, work in those countries to try and bring about the um, Marxist, the left-wing utopia that they firmly believed um, was, uh, was incorporated into the statements of Frelimo and MPLA and PAIGC. Um, and among these people, the, the, there were some academics who settled out there, um, wrote um, their histories or wrote their, their books about what was going on in Angola, Mozambique, etc. And because there were so few people in um, the uh, Western academic world who were doing any research in this area, these books, these works got um, a lot of consideration. Um, they circulated widely. They were read as statements about what was really happening in that part of Africa. And uh, Nuno Vidal mentioned, you know, the red feet. I think it's the most wonderful description and, um, I, I, <laughs> that Patrick apparently invented to describe a number of these people. But this has to be seen in the context, I think, of um, the uh, steady disillusionment of left-wing utopians in, in Europe, you know, with what happened in China, with what happened in Russia, with what happened in Vietnam. Now we can focus on Africa, where uh, the, the left-wing utopia is going to um, uh, at last be realized. Now, I think there's one very interesting um, aspect of this, and that is the division between Anglophone and Francophone writers. Whereas Anglophone writers, whether uh, British or American, uh, tended to be left-wing Marxist, 
radicals, etc. There was a marked difference among Frank uh, many Francophone writers. So you mentioned Christine Messian, um, but if, if you look at Mozambique, you have uh, Christine Geoffrey, uh, M uh, Michel Caon, uh, again, who um, were constructing a rather different narrative of what was happening from that which was being disseminated by the Anglophones. So there is this quite interesting division between Anglophone and Francophone. Any other questions? Toby. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I have a question for everybody here. And I think one of the things that we celebrate today is Patrick's resonance. Well, I was just wondering if um, cultural history is, is, isn't an area where you can uh, bring in um, the knowledge, the insights from um, a wide variety of uh, uh, traditional academic disciplines. And cultural history is, uh, is certainly um, thriving um, in academia. But whether, I'm right out of touch now, whether, whether that's <laughs> a realistic uh, answer to the question, I don't know. Patrick himself, of course, emphasized the uh, huge important role that culture played in understanding politics, mm -hmm. in understanding history. And this is one of the major themes of his writing, in fact. Would you like to step in here? Well, I think, um, You can argue that the RAE in 1992, followed by 1996, followed by 2001, followed by 2008, now 2013, and to be 2020, is one long process of deconstructing interdisciplinary work. Of course. Not deliberately, but because panels are defined or define themselves. The, the, but that's not entirely true in the sense that it is for the historians to be able to set out the scope of what they think of as history. For the economists, for the political scientists, for the etc. And, and it is not the case that interdisciplinary work is easily pigeonholed into the area studies panels within RE, REF RE structures. So in a sense, it's for us as academics who inform the definition of the discipline, in a sense to, picking up on your point, to ensure that cultural history, literary history, other forms of investigation of history are all included, as they generally are to a reasonable extent when you look at the defining terminology that these, era, these panels, these in the art ref process um, set out. Um, it's to ensure that in a sense they, that the discipline does remain diverse. There are people who have a view of what their own disciplines have done. So there are economists who take a view that the, the ref and RAE definitions of economics is far too narrow simplistic and ideologically motivated and they pursue a different tack within that field well there are always going to be debates and discussions around what are the different movements within a discipline and how do new disciplinary subfields and areas of collaborative work emerge but i i'm not sure that the ref overall and the ra has been uh, an advantage or a help <laughs> in pursuing a vision which I think Patrick held and manifested in his own work very dear. <laughs>
And I think that it, 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 one can't underestimate the, the significance of what Patrick did in the, as, a, as an interdisciplinarian. He actually had mastered the, the, te the technology, as it were, of several disciplines. It wasn't just living with bits of things. It wasn't a small business. Mm. And he really was a serious yeah. scholar of literature. He understood literary criticism. He understood uh, the, the, the huge body of literature on literature. It wasn't just picking up novels and using bits of them to illustrate bits of historical argument. Similarly, as a historiographer, he was a serious historian. He actually read books about historical theory and how you do history. I don't think that in the training of modern young historians, there's very much space for that. And that's, I think, the sadness, is that how many people on the brink of graduate careers are multilingual enough to be good comparativists, for starters, and to be able to read uh, books in other languages. Very rare, I said. So that we have fewer and fewer early historians. That you're not reproducing yourself in vast numbers, terribly, I regret to say, because there aren't that many people being produced who have your language skills. That's such a rarer and rarer thing. And the idea that in the course of an undergraduate career or a master's degree, you pick up that kind of subtlety and depth of knowledge that Patrick clearly had uh, is almost that's almost utopian, I regret to say. Uh, I think it's a great tragedy, actually. And that goes back to the RAE, and that that kind of work takes time to produce. It can't yeah. be done in three years. Well, I'm going to use my privilege as, as chairman of this session to, to ask you two questions. The first one, uh, there was some years ago a gap or not a very uh, consistent dialogue between Western researchers and African researchers. How do you see this situation evolving? Is there a better dialogue? Is it more consistent, this pursuit of, of, uh, of inquiry? And the second question concerns the um, not old, but the pattern of area studies and the emergence of world and global history. Uh, how do you personally see this new challenge? Well, I, I, I would have to pass on the first one. I don't think I have anything useful to say about um, the, the conflict between African researchers and Western researchers. Um, but how, the, the way in which African studies has begun to merge with what you possibly describe as global um, is certainly a notable trend and a very welcome one. Um, it's particularly clear in the world of Atlantic history um, where uh, for a long time uh, Africanists thought of Africa as largely a, a discrete uh, body. Uh, yes, colonialists came in from outside but it wasn't part of the, the, wider, um, the wider trends going on in the world. Now I think anybody looking at Atlantic history um, has to in, in, incorporate the African dimension and see, in, and see African society as being part of um, a wider Atlantic um, community, an Atlantic society. Um, in, just very quickly to focus on something purely uh, looser foam, it's now, I think, quite common to uh, have the Lusophone islands off the coast of Africa, uh, Cape Verde, San Tome, Principe, often referred to as um, the Caribbean, an African Caribbean. They have to be seen in the same uh, kind of historical trajectory as the uh, Caribbean islands. And I think this is a sign of the way in which uh, Africa is now being seen um, as part of the uh, great Atlantic world. If you turn to the Indian Ocean, well, you get the same, um, the same kind of trend. Um, uh, the uh, African diaspora in the Indian Ocean is much less well known than the African diaspora in the Atlantic, but it is now being researched. Um, and we're beginning to realize quite how extensive it was and how the East, um, east Coast of Africa 
formed part of um, the wider Indian Ocean and, and Southeast Asian world um, in a way which uh, was simply not understood sort of 20 years ago. So um, I've no doubt at all that uh, African studies is now being uh, drawn in these two directions into um, a wider perception of uh, global trends and global influences. On your first question, there are, there are some interesting initiatives that, that have been going on in the last few years, which I think um, have considerable potential. Um, the, uh, the British Academy, in collaboration with the Association of Commonwealth Universities, uh, picked up on the, you will remember from 2005, and the uh, Commonwealth uh, uh, and the Africa uh, meeting, um, you know, there was this phrase, African answers to African problems. And there, there was a debate in many, many fora about, well, what does that mean in practice? Um, and uh, the Association of Commonwealth Universities and the British Academy together um, organized a, a meeting fundamentally with the Association of African Universities in Nairobi, uh, which discussed what are the issues facing researchers uh, in African universities and what are the appropriate types of relationship that there ought to be between northern universities or UK universities in that particular instance and, and those research communities. It was a very interesting debate and a report was produced. Uh, it's available from the British Academy website and, and the ACU website. It went on to focus on one, ish, one particular problem which was identified by a range of people from both Francophone African universities and, and Anglophone African universities, which was the, the situation that early career researchers find themselves in. They may have been lucky enough to get a PhD either from, uh, say, WITS or from UCT or from uh, Calcutta or from um, Warwick or Paris or whatever it was. Going back into the department, <coughs> repeatedly the stories were of drowning in teaching or a drowning in administration. And then 10 years later, looking up and saying, what happened to my research career? What happened to that? that PhD, which was the training in scholarship that I was then going to take forward in research and in working with training another generation of, of researchers? What happened to it? Disappeared. Nothing. I published nothing. I've got nowhere. Um, so those kinds of stories um, began to um, suggest that there might be particular international initiatives to support early career researchers in a range of, in, in this case, humanities and social science disciplines in African universities. And, and recommendations and proposals um, came forward from that. Well, as with all of these things, they perhaps sit on a, a shelf and dust collects. However, since then, it's clear that a number of agencies have actually taken on board some of that discussion. So, for example, DFID is now funding to the tune of about five million over a four-year period a program that is called CIRCLE. I forget what the acronym means, but essentially what it is doing is it is saying in, in relation to climate change, both climate science and all of the issues around mitigation of climate, of climate change effects, they will fund researchers, early career researchers from a range of African universities to go to particular host institutions, not in Europe, not in the States, but in other parts of Africa. And they've identified six or seven, some in East Africa, some in West, and a number, of course, in South, South Africa, um, to develop that um, critical mass of experience of doing research and getting through all the mechanisms of writing and getting published and being part of a team and being able to apply successfully for grants and in a, to build a career. The very idea 10 years ago when DFID did nothing but support primary education that they might actually fund a program like that is, thinking back, truly remarkable. But they've done it. And they're also saying, if it works in relation to that particular field, 
Maybe it's a model which we will adjust out of experience. We can uh, apply to other disciplinary areas and subject fields. Now, that's just one example, and there are a whole range of other, uh, not, not necessarily funded by DFID, but other organizations, Ford, Carnegie, Rockefeller, and, um, and others, um, which, which are beginning, I think, to build a consensus around what are the appropriate relationships between those groups of researchers in African universities and people outside, and what is the nature of the support that, that they want and need, and how do they want it delivered. Um, and slowly moving towards research agendas being driven by their research experience. Now, it sounds great, it sounds wonderful. Whether it will really happen and how it will happen, who knows? But it's just little straws in the wind as to a possible bringing back together of the African studies community in the UK with the African, with the African studies community, if you can call it that, uh, in African universities, uh, for the better. Um, that, that is not to deny that there aren't a whole range of relationships between uh, UK universities uh, and organisations, ASA UK, or particular universities, Cambridge, King's, uh, uh, Oxford, etc., and, and African universities on a project basis doing all sorts of very important things that, 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 that I take very much for granted. Which, okay. Any other question? Yes. That was a lot of questions that have been uh, sort of brought to my attention in recent years. This is a question as to why Africans seem to have ignored this question about uh, African art and architecture. I mean, the question of uh, uh, Cubism originating in Africa, being a precursor to uh, Picasso, uh, and that kind of work. And also uh, the question of some architectural structures in Zimbabwe, I believe, which has been researched by the Germans, but uh, I think the Germans have kind of, they were saying, have re refused to uh, take it on board, I mean, as being uh, originally African. So it, it seems to pose the question, whereas in South South and Southeast Asia, uh, the, in the colonial situation, they have accepted all uh, kinds of uh, originations and initiations. But with regard to Africa, there seems to have been a particular problem in uh, advancing that way. So I wondered whether you know, there was any general consensus why this might be out, whether this improvement Frankly, I don't recognize that. I think that African art and African architecture, incredibly well-developed fields. Just have a look at the website of, for example, the Harvard Fine Arts Department and so on. There's a massive amount of literature mm. on African art, mm -hmm. massive amount <coughs> of art and architecture and, uh, and archaeology going on uh, all the time, and a massive amount of publication, some of which I'm grateful to say that uh, Michael Dwyer has, has been publishing. So I, I, I think it's one of those developed parts of African studies rather than the most stunted. Uh, yeah. And many initiatives in museums also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only in the United States, but for instance, the Musée d'Aper in, in Paris, they, they have an extraordinary program. I think also archaeologists and art historians in Africa are currently freer to research and express their findings than is the case certainly in India where there's a great deal of uh, governmental and pressure activity to thwart various archaeological and uh, art historical uh, investigations these days. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, before we conclude, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Farzana uh, Sheikh to, to say a few words. Oh, sorry, sorry for that. Yeah, it, it's better, it's better because it's good. Oh, okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
intended to say anything um, today or speak on, on, on this occasion. Uh, but on reflection, I felt that there was really no better moment than this uh, for me to convey to all of you my thanks and thanks on behalf of Emile, who could not regrettably be here uh, today to take part uh, in this memorial for his father, owing, as I explained to some of you, owing to a long-standing engagement uh, in Oxford, long-standing commitment in Oxford, where he's chairing a panel and reading a paper at a conference. So let me also say how grateful then we, Emile and I, are to King's College London and its principal, Professor Rick Trainer, to King's history department and particularly to its head, Dr. Adam Sutcliffe, and to the prime mover of this event, Dr. Toby Green, as well as to King's Department of Portuguese and Latin American Studies, and to its head, Dr. Catherine Boyle, for having organized this memorial to honor Patrick. As many of you are no doubt aware, Patrick was an intensely private person for whom the scale of such a public event and the effort of putting it all together would, I'm sure, have seemed excessive. Such acts of collective remembrance and grand reunions were not for him. Yet I'm also certain that Patrick would have been deeply moved by today's event. Not because it confirmed the high esteem in which he was clearly held, which he would have argued needed no public confirmation, but rather because it afforded a platform for voices keen critically to engage with his work as a teacher and a scholar of Africa. And indeed, as a thinker who, having wrestled with some big and often awkward questions in Africa, sought audaciously to test them in societies that lay beyond, as indeed he did in his last book, The End of Conceit. But today's event would also have been seen by Patrick as a fine demonstration of all that he judged best in the British University. Proof, I think, of what he would have liked to describe as the gold standard of intellectual endeavor. It is no coincidence that Patrick chose not to return to academia in his native France. Indeed, he often observed that whatever his scholarly achievements, he owed them all to the British University and its unrivaled spirit of free inquiry. Much as he came to believe that whatever quality of life he enjoyed in his final years, he owed to the matchless scare of the National Health Service. It goes without saying that King's remained to the very end the bedrock of Patrick's professional life. The institution that gave him the freedom to roam and straddle the domains of politics, of literature, and history. The freedom to carve his own niche with the study of Lucifone Africa but above all, the freedom to think outside the box, as so many of you have testified today. Speaking for myself, I confess that I hesitated long and hard before deciding to be present at today's memorial. For like Patrick, I'm instinctively wary of rituals, even while recognizing that they may bring rewards and consolation for some. But what finally determined my choice was the realization that being here today was no less than a vital extension of the sustained mutual intellectual engagement that Patrick and I had placed at the center of our rich life together. And for enabling this, I thank you all again. Thank you.